Hi, I'm Wendy Lou McGill, the Communications and Membership Director for NACIA, the North American Coalition for Insect Agriculture. And our mission is to encourage the positive use of insects in North America. We're very excited today to present Insects as Food and Feed as part of the Future of Food at South by Southwest, which is presented by Kroger Company and the Zero Hunger, Zero Waste Foundation. Today, we're very pleased to host this discussion with three of NACIA's members, which include Beta Hatch, Don Boguito, and Entomo Farm. In this panel, we will explore the potential, the reality, and some of the near-term prospects for insects as a growing part of circular economy, as well as sustainable agriculture and a rapidly warming world that faces increasing supply chain challenges. For this panel, we're using the Ellen MacArthur Foundation definition of a circular economy of food, which is um, a circular economy of food mimics natural systems of regeneration so that waste does not exist, but is instead feedstock for another cycle. This is a recorded webinar, um, but you're welcome to send any follow-up questions to info at nacia.org, N-A-C-I-A dot O-R-G. So I'm very, very pleased to present our panelists. And we're gonna start off today with Monica Martinez, who's the founder and CEO of Don Boguito. I'm the founder of Don Boguito. <laughs> Don Boguito is, um, an edible insect food business uh, who was born in 2011 in San Francisco, California. Um, we have been in, I guess, in the market for a little long time. Um, we, um, our goal was to introduce edible insects into the food market. Um, knowing at the time in 2009, 2010, edible insects was an unknown food um, in the United States. So Don Bullito, um opened the market in this area, uh, introducing edible insects with a cultural heritage, like we're trying to revive uh, Mexican pre-Columbian cuisine. Um, I was born in Mexico, raised and born in Mexico, and Mexico is one of the leaders on edible insects. We have more than 500 varieties of edible insects. So it seemed kind of weird the edible insects were not considered a type of food in the United States. So that's what we have been doing. Um, we have worked with many other farms in the United States, but in 2017, we were um, offered an opportunity to open our own farm operations. Um, we're still partnering with other farms, um, but we are uh, been developing our own uh, farming more holistically insects in here in California. So that's, that's why we are. Awesome, Monica, thank you. Um, next, we have Virginia Emery, who's the founder and CEO of Beta Hatch. Hello, I'm Virginia, founder and CEO of Beta Hatch. Uh, we produce insects for a bit of a different market. We're focused in animal feed. And so really helping to rethink the sustainability of what our meat eats and just finding different ways to feed, uh, not just animals in the food supply, but also uh, companion animals um, and uh, animals, even wild birds being one of the markets that we sell product for. Um, we're one of the leading producers of insects in North America. Uh, we have the largest mealworm production facility under construction here in Washington state where we operate. Um, and we're one of the leading producers of the mealworm. It's a type of uh, dry adapted beetle that we can produce at incredible yields. So very excited about this conversation uh, about the future of farming insects and insect products in our food system. So thank you, Virginia. And last but not least, we have Jared Golden, who is the founder and VP of Innovation and Research for Intimo Farms based in Canada. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with such an esteemed panel and uh, for change. I, I'm the minority in the group and it's wonderful to see the world changing in, in such a positive way. That said, uh, I founded Entomo Farms with my two brothers, Darren and Ryan, who were farming insects for the reptile trade and, and the bait trade. And we kind of responded to a white paper that was put out by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the um, uh, 
yeah, in uh, 2014. And the title was Edible Insects, Future Prospects for Food and Feed Security. And this is really, I feel, the document that woke up the Western world to the amazing opportunity that insects offered, both from a health perspective for people, a health perspective for their pets, and a health perspective for our livestock. Um, and of course, the uh, opportunity for producing fertilizer, which is the insect excrement known as brass. And we started with a, a humble um, 5,000 square foot farm back in 2014. And um, we've grown to approximately 60,000 square feet now with more uh, coming down the pipeline. And we've had the good fortune to work with businesses like Monica's and hope to work with others like uh, Beta Hatch and, and many other wonderful colleagues really all around the world um, as we disrupt and um, bring opportunities and innovation to food and feed. So thank you so much for inviting me on the panel um, and I look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, one of the things I'm so excited about for our discussion is that we have um, three different perspectives. Uh, we have food, uh, insects as feed represented. We have insects as food, and then also um, both sides of it in terms of both the farming and also the food production. So I think we'll be able to really cover a lot of ground with that. Um, so Monica, I wanted to ask you the first question. Um, as one of the, the earlier, maybe the earliest businesses in North America when the insects is food space, how have you seen the industry change in terms of sustainability and circular uh, economy of food practices? <laughs> That's a tough question because I think that depends from business to business. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like actually the, there is a little bit of obscure about I have each farm, you know, raises their own, you know, insects. Um, so I think that is, depends a lot. It comes from actually, you know, the origins of what is it, the goals of what, what's the culture behind the company. Um, I cannot talk about the whole industry, obviously. Um, I can only talk about us. Um, when we start, looking into one of our biggest challenges was to actually find insects. We did talk to, I remember we have worked with Entoma Farms very early stage. Um, we were looking to find um, insects. Um, there was not many farms that were like farming insects for edible, uh, for human consumption. And then some of the farms that we were working, they were not actually um, farming with the standards that we were looking for, like higher standards, the type of food um, of it, I should say. Um, so when we had the opportunity to open our own operations, um, one of the goals for us was not necessarily to become like circle economy. I mean, because it was hard, we definitely had this whole, we, we, we launched in this, um, complex organization that has hosted many other businesses and then we all work together. So the reason why we opened in that space is because we were supposed to, um, to work with some restaurants and get the scraps to feed our insects. But to our surprise, um, we got a giant no-no from the health department, um, but we can't, we had to have control of the quality of, of you know, of feed that our insects eat and that makes so much sense. There was put like, you know, risk of um, mold and, you know, um, <laughs> sorry, I have my daughter playing the piano. Lisa, I can't talk. Uh, so, um, so that was another challenge. So we, we could not like do become, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so we could not be a circle, a fully circular economy. Uh, in that way, but we start finding ways like, <laughs> I feel like, Lisa, we start finding ways like, as Gerald, <laughs> this is a product of COVID. I can maybe take the, the question a little bit too on sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're starting to understand how to measure these things. Um, you need to do a full life cycle analysis to really understand how the product, um, it, you know, what are the inputs being used, how you're sourcing those ingredients, how production happens in terms of the energy intensity, which is really dependent on your climate and the design of your systems. 
Um, and it takes a while to get that information. There's only a handful of companies in the world that um, have the capacity to even get that data. So I would say we're definitely far, you know, as, as Monica said, very far from as an industry being able to say anything about how um, you know, standard production is because there's each producer is a little bit different. Um, but what I can say is that there's some really exciting opportunities. Um, for example, our facility is using waste heat from a data center in order to preheat the air coming into our controlled environment and significantly reduce electrical needs of our facility. Um, so there are things like this that are some exciting opportunities that take a little creativity. And I think each company has sort of unique opportunities depending on their geography, um, the kind of feed producers near them um, and how they go about their production. Yeah, I don't know, Jared, if you have some examples near where you are in Canada, certainly I'm mm -hmm. sure there's some differences there. Yeah, and um, to circle back, I guess, in terms of, you know, how things have changed, I think, uh, Wendy, which was um, the question as, as well. Um, you know, when we when we first started going to shows and, you know, being inspired by the kind of work that, that Monica had done and create cookies and, and different foods with the powder and, you know, had some of the, the roasted season crickets out on the table for people to try. You know, maybe 10, 15 percent of people had even heard of this idea if they were lucky enough to have traveled down south to Mexico or out east. And they looked at it with some degree of, of disgust and, and they weren't quite sure. But as they tried it, maybe starting with a cookie or a slice of banana bread, uh, they realized how anticlimactic the experience was, tasted just like food. Um, as well as, you know, maybe being brave enough to try some of the whole roasted insects. And um, we've been, I think the whole industry has been very lucky with how much earned media we have all received. You know, there's a constant flow of articles all over, nationally and internationally. And, and I feel journalists have really approached this subject very maturely and very honestly. And, and that's been lovely to see. So fast forward six or seven years, now when we do shows, I would say closer to 75% of people have heard of it. It's touched them somehow. Um, and the propensity and their appetite, if you will, for trying it is much, much more open. And I really feel well, I've seen a paradigm shift in that respect, um, you know, in, in our small circle here in, in, uh, in North America. And certainly it seems the same way in Europe that there's a lot of movement um, with acceptance and, and openness to the entire paradigm. And if I may just take another minute, I think it has as much to do with the sustainability question that we're answering, as well as the health question, where, where we've all worked hard to do studies and, and begun to uncover amazing things like how much fiber there is or how much B12 there is or how much iron. And with universities doing studies on whether that's absorbable or whether it seems to have a clinical impact, that is waking people up to the fact that this isn't actually just about sustainability or a circular economy. It's not a sacrifice. This is, is something that could be extremely helpful and beneficial for everybody around the world, which, of course, Monica's ancestors have known for years. But again, the rest of us are just starting to figure that out. It's so, it's so really interesting to hear, actually, uh, Gerald, you know, talk about the percentages of like, yeah, 10 years ago, um, when you have like, you know, in the table insects and people would come and it was really like gross and, you know, like definitely a, a fear factor, um, reject factor about like insects as food. And then we definitely have uh, proved that 80% at least now, all the, peop all the people, um, are aware of insects as food. So we haven't gained a huge, um, um, I guess gain, like people are thanks to the media as Gerald mentioned, like, you know, we've been positive, like media has been amazingly positive with edible insects. 80% um, of people at least have here or have a family member of they have tried themselves, you know, edible insects and they can say, oh, it doesn't taste, it's not that gross, it's not like that, it tastes like, you know, like a pumpkin seed, or it tastes like, you know, like a nut and seeds. Um, and then to, you know, echo and sustainability, I mean, being also a farmer ourselves, is just mind blowing to know uh, the little amount, like how little resources actually edible insects um, need to be able to thrive and to grow. 
we I didn't mention, I got caught early, but I didn't mention that one of the methods that we were using here in, in, in California and Auckland is we, um, we're trying to grow our insects more holistically and we allowing the insects to actually be exposed to daylight um, to let them thrive when the sun comes out. We use greenhouses um, when the sun comes thrived and then um, let them reserve energy when the sun comes down and night drops temperatures. I mean, that's been a challenge. I know you guys probably have un understand, Gerald in Virginia, how challenging is that to control? So it also sounds like um, not only in practice, but sustainability may be um, something that is, is also driving consumers for the, on the insects as food side. Um, I was also wondering, uh, on the operational side, Virginia, um, I know that Beta Hatch is raising millworms using food waste, and um, and I'm wondering what are some of the, the operational or regulatory or just sort of practical um, challenges that you face when you're using food waste versus raw materials, and how do you um, how do you reconcile that with the need to have you know financial sustainability? Yeah, um, I should I should clarify the word waste, you know, it's, it's sort of a loaded concept that I think will virtually lose a lot of meaning. Um, and certainly we're seeing that um, that with more circular agriculture, um, we don't, I, I suppose what I would say is that we're, we're using more of a byproduct of food processing. Um, so this is a product at industrial scale produced consistently every day that is otherwise um, going to going to waste typically, um, but that's just because there hasn't been a good use to capture those calories back into the food system. So there's a lot of regulatory uh, limitations on what you can be using to produce insects. You have to be sourcing a feed grade uh, ingredient. So that's a really important distinction for everyone to understand from both the safety perspective and sort of how um, the industry interacts with regulation. Um, the FDA has um, rules around the production of animal feed that all, and, and similarly with food, um, the insect producers have to be compliant with. Um, but we also are trying to find the right opportunities where there's something like, in our case, um, apple cores that are otherwise going to be just going to a landfill um, or a composting operation that we can you know, recycle back immediately back into a food production uh, with our insect agriculture. And so with um, those types of ingredients, there are a lot of challenges, you know, bugs can eat virtually anything. Uh, if you prepare it in the right way, that doesn't mean it's economically going to be feasible for your business. So as a commercially producing um, insect uh, farm, we have to evaluate our feedstocks very carefully. We have to be looking at consistency throughout the year uh, between batches with our producers, sometimes their seasonality with their production, the cost, um, which is a cost we may have to pay for the ingredient or also transportation. One of our ingredients travels less than two miles. So that's a great, uh, you know, we we're actually looking at almost a bicycle approach for <laughs> moving some of those ingredients. Um, so reducing the carbon footprint on transportation, I think can be a great way that insect agriculture um, can help, you know, close some of these loops, but also shorten supply chains. Um, and I think that's something really exciting about insect production, which mirrors the roles that bugs play in nature as the recyclers of most nutrients. Um, but of course, we have to do this all in a safe um, way that, uh, you know, sources responsibly. And Jared, with Intimal Farms, um, what what are some of the ways that um, that you're that you've worked on um, sustainability or, or circular practices and and also what would you like to see more of in this regard and in general in the industry or with your farm and food company so yeah, thank you for the question and just to pick up a bit of where um virginia um left off or what she touched on which i think is so interesting when you consider upcycling different what, uh, what would be literal waste streams as opposed to byproduct streams like post-consumer waste that would go to a landfill or pre-consumer waste is that you know if we're working with a customer who wants to make a protein bar and they want to have label claims on that protein bar or they have a nutrition panel on that protein bar that says x amount of protein iron b12 fiber whatever all their ingredients have to be consistent 
which means that our ingredient has to be consistent, which means that our inputs have to be consistent. So besides, you know, the challenges of using um, wet materials that aren't dehydrated and dried, the larger challenge is the inconsistency of those upstream wastes. But our, our goal and dream is that other companies emerge that will take that, dehydrate it, process it into some kind of powder, figure out how to put additives in or take a little of this out and put a little of that in. So this feed input now becomes consistent and can be used constructively in, as a feed input into the edible insect market. So until that happens, it, it is challenging, but you know, as a disruptive, as a disruptive entrepreneur, I, I, I can see that happening for other people, that that will be a business that they'll figure out eventually and will be their customer for that, for that, um, which will, you know, add a whole nother dimension to the circular way in which we're feeding insects. That said, I, I also think that it's possible, like Virginia is saying, to perhaps have a farm next to a cornfield or next to a canola field where whatever, whatever isn't harvested, which is dry and leafy, can be a feed input for whatever insect you may be raising. And, and that would then enable you to produce the insect, sell it as food or feed, use the waste to fertilize the crop and, and keep that whole cycle going. Um, but, but for now, because our focus is on food and, and, and Virginia on, on feed, let's say, but even, you know, I think sometimes there's more science between the food for animals than for people because they're even more data driven when it comes to knowing exactly what's going in and exactly what they're going to get out of it. Um, I think there's a little bit more flexibility on the people side um, and, and maybe there can be one day some flexibility from the FDA on, on you know, a kind of margin of error on a nutrition panel, allowing for some of those nutrients to have some flexibility, um, knowing that it's much, much better for, for the world, for, you know, for um, the sustainability piece that's so important to all of us. I'm not sure if I answered your question though, Wendy. I, I, I think that maybe I just uh, elaborated on Virginia's point. No, I think you absolutely did. There's, there definitely isn't, there are no re wrong answers. Um, <laughs> Monica, you, you said that uh, in, your, in your current farm, farming uh, area that you are embedded with other businesses and that, and that you, the, the, the hope is to have the interaction in, in the farming process between the businesses. How, and you mentioned also that there have been some challenges. What, how, how is it working now? And, and what are some, you know, ways that you'd love to, you'd like to see it improve? I think the improvement is like we are, <laughs> for us, right now, for, we have get a lot of um, criticisms about like, why not becoming a, you know, like the, the, the scale of our farm is very, very small in comparison to any other one out there. And then we're trying to keep through to like applying holistic practices using less, you know, there's no need for us. We're trying to don't use extra energy that we don't need to use. Obviously the feed that we use is really high cost, like organic, non-GMO. Um, we have, a, you know, we're trying to feed like uh, we have like a kind of like our own mix of food. We use organic vegetables. Uh, we're trying to work some companies like Imperfect Foods to try to get, you know, vegetables, obviously they don't get to make it to markets. Um, they're rejected by, you know, defects, but minor, you know, cuts there and here. Um, but we used to have, I mean, we still have to use certified product and, you know, um, we need to prove and we have a log, we have, you know, we following HACCP. Um, steps i mean guidance guidance um we we are you know we are look, looking for organic certifications right now um but um the challenges we're gonna we had to scale up and how to continue to like be uh economical be out, uh, you know be able like what's the word um uh, to be able to still profit um that is a big challenge in trying not to follow to become an industrial farm practice like you know to to re, like kind of like copy what hasn't worked for us. So we know the industrial farming practices 
are not good for anyone, are not sustainable. Um, so that's the challenge um, to how to continue being, you know, doing in a small, like we're trying to develop these kind of pod systems. Um, something that we are an urban farm, definitely. Um, so we're trying to, the goal is to try to create something that can be replicated and move, you know, um, in another um, urban areas easily. Um, so, yeah, I hope, I mean, I hope I answered your question. I think it's interesting, Wendy, because within uh, Nisia and within the um, mm -hmm. industry of insect production, you do get a huge amount of variety of scale, different uh, business models, different types of um, operations. And we've seen this with plant production and food production as well. So it's not surprising that insects production is mirroring some of those patterns. Uh, but I think we have the benefit of being able to learn from the mistakes that uh, have been made in other crops. Um, so, you know, many of our, 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 much of our production, for example, is monoculture. And so then thinking about how um, disease and pests and the things that impact other crops are going to impact insects. These are um, considerations that when you're producing at a very large scale, you need to be thinking about in a different and creative way. So trying to apply kind of the best of all of the previous practices and, and certainly working in a controlled environment is very different than working in a, um, in a greenhouse um, and there's benefits and trade-offs of each approach but one of the I guess beautiful things about insects on top of just the diversity um, you know we grow one species but there are millions of species of insects out there with huge amounts of potential beyond even just food and feed we're talking about um, you know the there's all kinds of biological services but also um, pharmaceutical and cosmetic and other applications that we're barely scratching the surface with so um, it's, it's really exciting for me to be speaking on a panel with producers who just have very different types of systems. And I think that um, we're going to continue to see a, a very exciting proliferation of different scales of systems. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm, I was curious to uh, sort of going off of that, how each of you think that um, what, what are some of the ways that insects as food and feed could be most disruptive to this more linear food and agriculture system? I think you've, you've mentioned some of them, but if you were going to pick the top one or two, um, what do you think, what do you think that they might be from your particular corners of the industry? Jared, did you want to go first? It'd be great to hear from you again, too. Sure. Um, you know, I think uh, Virginia brought the point up earlier on um, life cycle assessments, which is basically a data point derivative of, of energy use. And if you go back to that uh, UN and uh, FAO document, you know, they certainly had data already um, that primarily had to do with water and the savings of water. And that really has to do with the utilization of grains as feed inputs for traditional. Um, livestock agriculture, industrially speaking, and the amount of, of forest that has to be cut down and the amount of water that has to be used to grow grains to feed chicken and cows. And unfortunately, um, they're just not great converters of those feed inputs to food. You know, cows convert at about 10%, and we think we can get, you know, the crickets even maybe above 100%. Um, certainly we're approaching 80%. So when you look at the space required to produce a unit of protein and the amount of resource that's required as a derivative of water, I think a fair loose calculation that, that I came up with was that if a family of four got their protein from insects one day a week, so that's about 50 grams of protein each, which is the average that most people need a day, um, that if they did that one day a week for a year, they would save about 750,000 liters of water. So if you begin to extrapolate that across states like California, you, you could see that this is really paradigm shifting. Um, so I think that's a great example. And then, of course, greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, you know, crickets and mealworms basically don't fart. So there isn't a huge concern uh, about that. So those are just two quick points off the top of my head that I think are very exciting in terms of, of shifting um, some very real 
issues. Um, the third, if I may, again, would be the role of fraff in regenerative soil agriculture and the potential to actually convert some desertified sands back to soils, um, which to me is very exciting. And then enhancing root systems to trap more carbon. So, you know, again, to Virginia's point and something Monica mentioned earlier, we are truly just scratching the surface and, um, you know, and the amazing thing is every time we turn over a rock to look at more data, it seems to blow our minds, you know, <laughs> like, what do you mean there's B12? There's that much B12? What do you mean the frass can be a fertilizer? It works that well? Um, now we need empirical uh, studies and, and, and objective research to, to define and quantify that, but anecdotally and, and what we've learned so far it should um, be very interesting to everybody from the investment community to the young child, you know, dreaming of, of a future vocation that would be meaningful and, um, and make a difference. Yeah, I think the, one of the things that has driven Beta Hatch to um, approach the production in the way that we have is, is recognizing that the scale of a lot of these challenges in the food system are very large. And so we need to be matching the scale of our solutions to those problems. So, um, you know, I, I think that for on the feed side in particular, um, there are a lot of challenges um, and, and many of them even just simply are sort of logistical with that we have most of our protein supply chain depending on very seasonal uh, ingredients that are harvested once or twice a year in just a couple of places in the world. Fish meal being an example where, um, you know, even with El Nino, we'll see huge fluctuations in um, wild harvests of fish. And then that has all these impacts sort of down the supply chain, sometimes for years to come. And so I think finding ways to make the system more resilient to climate disruption, to match year round supply with, um, or year round demand for feed with year round supply. And, you know, people eat year round and are growing accustomed to the same menu throughout the year. And so finding ways that our food system can adapt to um, those needs is really important. And, and certainly the, the threat of um, droughts and other climate impacts is a probably the biggest place I can see insects making a big impact because we have uh, more control over our production than a lot of other crops. And so we can buffer against some of the uncertainty that we will continue to see in a lot of other systems. Um, and we also have um, some exciting opportunities to find a lot of co-location opportunities. So we're co-located with this data center so we can take their waste heat. We're also uh, very near a lot of large food processing companies. Um, we're in a town that's uh, Wenatchee, Washington, known as the Apple Capital. And so we're trying to find ways that we can find those synergies where we can be taking, say, Apple byproducts as one of our feed inputs and then getting the frass from our production back onto those orchards. Um, and helping to create um, these loops that we've broken with our food system. So I think um, there, there's a lot of exciting opportunity, especially at the large scale that we're operating at. And if I can add just one point to that, uh, mm -hmm. Virginia and all, that a kind of an area of interest of mine um, that's developed over the last year, um, i.e. COVID, is a hedge against coronaviruses jumping to livestock and not people. And it is very possible that one of these viruses will jump to chicken next, not people. And you can only imagine what would happen around the world if a pandemic spread among chicken. And right now, there are certain species of insects like the cricket we grow, the banded cricket, um, that is, seems to be um, immune to, to almost any known virus at, at this time. So the idea of governments hedging massive amounts of, of warehouse space, should that happen, given how quick our turnaround times can be, is a very important consideration that I think the scientific world should be paying a lot of attention to. Because you talk about you know, food security and feed security and some of these other wonderful uh, advantages of, of raising insects um, as an addition to protein production. Um, and I hate using that word because they are so much more than protein, um, um, that um, this, this idea and, and the opportunity for, for funding to study the ability for insects to be raised as a food source, as a hedge against, God forbid, one of these viruses jumping to our livestock instead of our loved ones, 
I think is a very important consideration for the industry. And I'd love to see more attention placed on that agenda. Just to add to that, I mean, there's viruses like the bird flu already wipe, like, you know, like two years ago, three years ago, Mexico depends on egg production, like 80% of the protein consumption of the country comes from egg production. And then they have to be like millions of chickens killed because bird flu and mouth cow disease. And there's so many already diseases. So, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, the importance to start talking about like how resilient insects are and how genetically they're very different to humans. That is a huge positive aspect. So we start including insects as, as food um, and feed, I guess it's already feed, you know? We always use the term, David, you eat farm chickens and farm, you know, um, farm fish, you're already eating insects. So <laughs> um, insects definitely have many more positive, you know, things that, but it's definitely a key point to talk, to start talking about insects. Yeah, and I um, think- As food. Yeah, uh, to, to bring diversity, we, we talked, you were talking, Virginia, about like uh, monoculture, you know, monocrops, mono, like, you know, culture and food. So insects will definitely bring diversity, you know, diversity on the food um, change. We, every family, you know, at least in the United States, is start including insect meal uh, one day at the week that would make a huge impact on beef consumption, on chicken and poultry and pork uh, consumption, and definitely be, you know, huge uh, sustainable um, impact. Yeah, one of the interesting uh, things about insects uniquely in the alternative protein space um, is that a lot of the innovation that's been happening with it, say, you know, uh, some of these great plant-based product companies is they don't necessarily, they'll, they'll impact on the product side um, but not necessarily on the supply chain side. And I think a lot of the innovation that's been happening in the insect industry has been on the supply chain side um, because that's where we see some of the biggest opportunities with insects. Um, and, you know, the benefits are beyond just basically nutrition, but also in animal health. So, you know, this is an ingredient that is very natural, um, natural part of most uh, animal diets. Um, and certainly we are all already consuming uh, insects in one form or another, uh, no matter what you're eating, even if you're a vegetarian, um, because they're it's just such a part of the food system. Um, but because of that, there's a lot of these immune boosting effects uh, and improvements in gut health and other benefits that we see in aquaculture, we see in poultry production, um, we see in um, swine and other animals. So there's a lot of different benefits. And it's a very exciting time because we're just at the beginning of sort of scraping the, the, just the surface of the opportunity here. Um, so I think we're gonna just continue to see an acceleration of the industry and of insects um, on the shelves and in, in the food supply. In terms of, um, of thinking about how consumers, like shifting back a little bit to the, to the food side, um, when uh, when we're looking at consumers and how they may be looking for sustainability, how do you think that that can be squared against um, some of the trends in in, um, in food, especially in consumer packaged goods, about things like single serving single serving products or some of the plant based proteins that are relying upon monoculture crops like soy and wheat? So how how do you think that as an industry we can reconcile the, the, the sort of perceived desire from consumers to eat in ways that are more sustainable, but the, you know, what they're sort of doing with their dollars, so to speak, how they're voting in terms of uh, what they're choosing. That's, and Jared, do you have some questions, some ideas about that? The amazing thing about this particular paradigm is that it's as much an ingredient as it is a whole food. So, you know, for example, someone could shop at a bulk barn type of store and bring their own glass container and put in a couple pounds of mealworm powder or cricket powder, take that home and add it to their banana breads and their and their um, soups and their chilies, or you know, a, a whole bunch of Monica's dry roasted bugs at the same place in the same jar and sprinkle that on their salad. Um, you would go a long way to eliminate any waste associated with farm-to-food production. That said, unfortunately, Wendy, 
not everybody has the time or the aptitude to make their own food and they're going to want to buy a consumer packaged good product. I guess the onus is on us to work with um, sister businesses that are producing sustainable packaging, um, sustainable glues, uh, and um, sustainable, um, you know, uh, I guess packaging for the most part, um, so that we can feel much better about one-off pieces of, of production. And obviously, that side of, of consumer packaged good businesses is is picking up, and there, there's a lot more um, research again to be got, to be done, and but there's a lot more opportunity for businesses like ours to choose those kinds of companies that are making more sustainable mm -hmm. or environmentally friendly packaging. And Monica, for you, um, I'm curious, how, how do you feel that you could be using sort of the power of snacking, um, given that you make what I think are really delicious snacks, um, and, and given the, the, the increasing popularity of snacking that we, you know, studies are saying that more Americans are eating uh, are snacking versus having sit down meals, for example. So is that something that um, you think we could use in terms of, um, in terms of, of sort of uh, the, the sustainability and, and the different pieces of food productions for that? So um, our experience with our Actually, the word sustainability, like realistically, has been like, uh, kind of, let me see, let me rephrase this. So at the beginning, right, we were using a lot of like the term sustainability, our products are sustainable, um, you know, so we are all about sustainability, blah, 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 insects are sustainable. And then realistically, we came to find out that probably 80, 90% of the people out there have no idea or clue what actually that term means. What does that mean for them? Why, why would they care about something as sustainable? Um, so, I mean, one of the biggest parts of Don Bujito, like the first four or five years of Don Bujito's life, it was literally based on educating people about what sustainable means, why edible insects are important, why we need to start including edible insects and why they will help us to create a more sustainable food system. Um, so that, you know, it still is a challenge when we design our new packaging. I mean, it's not new anymore, but um, talking about packaging design is one whole monster, but you know, um, and the packaging, we're trying to make it make our products say, okay, kind of decipher what actually sustainable means. And we actually one of the first ones who came like good for you, good for the planet. And now you can see that slogan literally in everywhere. <laughs> but um, what does that mean, right? What does that mean that it's good for me, good for the planet? So we're trying to decipher what sustainable means. Um, regarding the packaging, it's very sad that, you know, the steel, the packaging industry hasn't produced something that's like barrier, like oxygen barrier, that will give, especially our products, like the, the barrier that they need. Uh, we did like years of research about like how to, like we actually started with compostable packaging and realized that our products were like one month shelf life when we were requesting like at least seven months or eight months of shelf life. Uh, once we start moving and scaling up uh, to be in markets. Um, so we sadly, we had to move to aluminum foil packaging, which is not recyclable. Um, it has a poly, polyethylene, polyethylene um, layer. But I mean, there's still like, there's, there's good, good news is that there's definitely companies working on creating, you know, that type of like more compostable um, recycled packaging uh, for snacks. Uh, the snack market is huge. Uh, one note, uh, you mentioned the plant-based products. So when we came in into like the big game, like Expo West, uh, fancy food shows, all these trade shows, um, the plant-based moving movement was like very baby stage. And we thought, okay, the edible insect is gonna hit hard, beauty foods what's in the market, end of farms, aspire. And then something happened that the plant-based foods totally took over. Um, and then we kind of fight it and kind of shadow, you know, cover the edible insect uh, movement. Um, and then unfortunately, a lot of companies went out of business. A lot of companies gave up. They were, you know, you've seen it. A lot of people come, have come out thinking they're gonna become millionaires in a year. They realize they're not millionaires and they give up. Um, it's definitely a hard market. It's, um, a lot of work, a lot of like consistent, you know, um, 
you had to believe on it. You had to, we one of the only ones probably because of that. <laughs> uh, we've been beat up many times. We, you know, you, you were one of those, you know, businesses and you know how hard it is. But anyway, so hopefully eventually everything, when you talk about edible insects, everything, every single aspect of it can cover the definition of sustainability. Yeah, I think one of the problems, Wendy, is that uh, people are not willing to pay for the real cost of food. So mm -hmm. the food is expensive. Um, it, it is um, expensive in a lot of ways that are intangible as well when we start thinking about the um, impacts that certain farming practices have on sort of the, the health of the soil and the ability to continue to farm. So um, while consumers do, I guess, understand the, the value and the, um, the, the benefits of organic production or more sustainable production, um, that's not always translating to dollars. So I think this is where having um, some, some larger uh, forces such as um, you know, government programs to help support sustainable practices and incentivize sustainable business practices, um, ways that um, we can be incentivizing um, certain types of markets to really look seriously at some of these newer solutions before they're at full scale as well. And certainly the investment community has been very important um, and has put a lot of dollars towards these alternatives to help them get through that tough stage because there's a sort of gap between starting out and getting to a point of um, you know, enough momentum uh, within the marketplace. And so I think we're starting to, to see that momentum happening. There are products, uh, in, for example, um, insect-fed eggs in Europe that are incredibly successful because um, it's a combination of the consumer understanding the messaging, the price being right, um, and sort of that messaging of the sustainability translating from the insect producer through the poultry producer through to the consumers and, and the uh, supermarket chains. And so I think it's a really an ecosystem challenge for everyone to um, help these new products and ingredients um, become fulfill their potential really, because it is an incredible potential if even just a small amount of protein were habits that we have were to be changed, the impact could be really significant. Absolutely. And Virginia, you actually um, answered our last question already, which is, I think, or I'm going to take it as your answer because we're actually just about out of time. Um, so for Monica and, and Jared, um, what are some of your, what is, what is like your greatest hope and sort of a lightning round um, for the Insects food and feed uh, industry in terms of fostering gen genuine sustainability? So in the next, like, say, two to three years? Um, you know, for me, and I guess it fits right in with, with, with what Virginia was just talking about, I, you know, this idea of, like, traditional meat production versus plant-based food production, insects really do have their own very unique lane. And, again, to me, it comes back to the nutritional side of things, is in that meat does not contain fiber. And plants do not contain B12. And insects have both. And this is a really neat point of leverage, I think, for us, for, for people to understand from a, a health and wellness or nutritional point of view. You get the best of the meat world in a sustainable, healthy protein um, and, and um, B12. And you get the best of the plant world in a sustainable fiber. And most people, although food and feed security it, it has an issue, most North Americans are not protein deficient, they're fiber deficient. And, and not only is the prebiotic fiber from the chitin and, and other parts of insects like crickets and mealworms so important, studies already have shown that it feeds great um, probiotic bacteria that are associated with reducing heart disease and stuff like that. So my hope is that we, we can continue to do research and, and, you know, prove to people that what water is to liquids, insects are to food. That sounds like a great um, tagline. Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah. that is true. I mean, that is true. Um, the tricky thing is how we translate that information into the public and then how we close, um, you know, in general, like, same thing that we have encountered that most people didn't know the term of sustainability, like how we educate. Education is a main key like role in bringing something new. Um, how we educate people about 
the benefits, right? The nutritional, um, the nutritional benefits of insects, uh, definitely they win. Um, but one, um, let me go back to a little bit what I was, I was gonna try to say it is, um, well, sorry, I was looking at my daughter with like glue in the carpet and I got distracted. <laughs> Uh, right, so okay, we were talking go about in three girl. years. <laughs> so, so yeah, educating is a big thing. But besides that, I feel like we are actually we are suffering right now. Um, Don Bujito is actually struggling because there's not many other businesses. Um, it's really amazing to see how much in Europe the insect market has been flourishing, and how you know mealworms are completely even more accepted before crickets and you know they use they don't use much crickets because there's not that many cricket production like close by um and they have more influence in north um and africa kind of like eating uh, insect style than actually you know us but the diversity of businesses and thriving businesses in europe is, com is incredible amazing and positive why when we see the picture in the united states it's not that exciting anymore like we you know we one of the only few businesses there's tons of businesses that came out and then suddenly you're like where are all those what happened to all those businesses we need them so we need more businesses to 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 come out to flourish um and then to start helping you know being being there being presence like one of the missing elements that people said i don't know where i can get insects um i don't know and then we get this amazon thing is amazon is just not helping us much um but anyway, so we need in three more years, I would love to see more businesses flourishing in the United States and promoting not only crickets, come on guys, there's more, you know, more insects than just crickets. Mealworms are, mealworms won't like, they win the race to crickets. Like, like for every possible, like imagine, you know, item like food, um, the amount of food, the amount of water, the, res the resilience of it, the antibiotic that they create, the, you know, the frazz that they create, everything, mealworms win. There's so much more to explore on mealworms and crickets, but- We agree, um, we agree. We'd love to see more product yeah, companies exploring um, mealworms, yeah. It's, a, it's too bad we don't have someone we, uh, on farming black soldier flies, because we could have a bit of a, we could have Jared on, in Cricket Corner and then the two of you in, uh, in the mealworms. Well, well, there's a little bit for everyone. That's the fun part of the insect world. Indeed, indeed. And that's only, as you pointed out, Virginia, three species among millions. Um, we have we have sadly run out of time for this discussion, sad to me at least, because it's been such a privilege to, um, to, to have this discussion with each of you. And I want to thank um, anyone who has joined us virtually later in the future for this for this panel and we encourage you to learn more about insect agriculture and sexist food and feed at nastia.org it's um same as the oh, other side <laughs> nacia.org and we also encourage you to look for local organizations in your areas that are working on circular food economies looking on regenerative agriculture food tank is a really good organization to do that at foodtank.org so thank you so much to Monica, Virginia, and Jared for joining us. And we will uh, hope to hear from viewers at some point. Thank you. Thank you.